Hi guys and welcome. In this video I'll be discussing how to correctly configure your wheel settings in Forza Motorsport 7 for the most realistic feel. Now I have already done a video covering wheel settings, however since then I have learned far more about what each setting does and have even compared a few real life cars to those in game to help find the most realistic feedback settings possible. While determining my settings I was using a Logitech G920 wheel, pedals and manual shifter. So the first step is to explain what each adjustment controls and how you can use these controls to recreate the realism you've been looking for. The first thing we need to do is open the advanced controller options. These can be accessed via the options menu from either the main page or pause menu. From the main page, tab across to progress, then select options, select controller, and from the controller options menu, press X to access the advanced controller options. Now the top half of this menu focuses entirely on dead zone settings. So, what is a dead zone? When you apply pressure to one of the controls, they respond to your input. Dead zones are used to ignore any input you make within a desired range. To highlight why an adjustment like this is useful, consider this. When you press the brake pedal in your real car, the pedal may move slightly before the brakes begin to operate. This could be due to the brake fluid being too low, or the pedal simply being a little loose. But whatever the reason, nothing happens for that small initial movement. Your brake pedal has a real life dead zone. Now this is something you get used to, especially after you spend years driving the same car. So when you get your wheel and pedal set up at home, these real life dead zones can be reproduced using dead zone adjustments, resulting in a far more familiar and realistic feel. Dead zone adjustments are available for steering, all three pedals and the handbrake and are adjustable for both the inside and outside areas of each control. The inside dead zone determines how much movement of the control is required before your input is registered by the game. The larger you set this figure, the more you need to press the control before the game registers your input. Much like our brake pedal scenario, we can make the pedal move by a desired amount before anything happens. The outside dead zone determines how far the control is required to move before the game registers your input as 100%. The lower you set this figure, the less you need to press the control before 100% pressure is registered. Continuing with our brake pedal example, pressing the brake all the way down to 100% pressure is seriously hard work, so by lowering the outside dead zone, the game can register 100% pressure when the pedal is only down to about 80% of its full range, or whatever setting you choose. It must be noted that no matter where you set your dead zones, the game still registers inputs scaled between 0 and 100%, but the larger the dead zones become, the less active range you have with the control, therefore increasing sensitivity relative to the dead zone sizes. So now we know what dead zones are and how they may be useful, let's look at getting them correctly positioned. For my steering control I did not want any dead zones. The moment I move my wheel, even by the slightest amount, I want the game to register what I'm doing, so for that reason the inside has been set to zero. I also don't want to increase the sensitivity of the wheel, at least not via dead zone adjustments. For that I'll be using the wheel rotation angle, so the outside dead zone has been set to 100. Moving down to the accelerator adjustments, I am used to a very small amount of pedal movement before fuel flow is increased, so I've set the inside setting to 5. Now the pedal will move just slightly before any input is registered. By doing this I have marginally increased the sensitivity of the pedal, but as I want to keep this increase to a minimum and I don't have any difficulty pressing the accelerator pedal all the way down, I've set the outside dead zone to 100. The brake pedal was a tricky one to figure out, but once I had it set correctly, it seemed so obvious how it should be done. If you're using a Logitech G920 and you haven't removed the rubber stop from inside the brake pedal, then you're going to be pleased you left it there. Most people I've spoken to believe the brake pedal is far too stiff with the rubber stop installed, however I think it offers something incredible if you set your dead zones correctly. The inside dead zone for your brake pedal needs to be set so that no brake input is registered by the game until the exact moment you feel the resistance of the rubber stop under your foot. To get this dead zone configured correctly, 
Pay attention to the red bar by the speedometer. This gives visual confirmation when the game registers you are applying the brakes. The red line should only begin to appear at the same time you feel resistance from the rubber stop. For me this happened with the inside dead zone set to 18 and for anyone else using the Logitech setup with the same rubber stop installed, I'd imagine it's going to be close to that figure for you guys too. Now with the rubber stop installed, as previously mentioned, it does mean pressing the brake pedal all the way down is difficult, so I've set the outside dead zone to 88. This registers 100% pressure in game without me having to put so much pressure into the pedal that it becomes hard work. For the clutch pedal I've set the inside dead zone to 5, allowing once again for some slight movement of the pedal before any input is registered. This may be very useful if you tend to rest your foot on the clutch pedal when you're not using it, although in real life this is terrible driving practice and should be avoided to prevent unnecessary clutch wear. I've set the outside dead zone to 55. While this is very low and makes the pedal far more sensitive to movement, it now requires far less pedal movement to register 100% pressure, allowing for faster clutch work and less crunched gear changes, while maintaining an acceptable level of clutch control. As many people, I have the handbrake control assigned to a button, so these values for me are completely irrelevant. For nothing other than aesthetics, I have set the inside and outside values to 0 and 100 respectively. So that concludes the dead zone settings and now we can move on to feedback settings. In this section you can adjust how much feedback you receive from your wheel in a variety of different forms. The strength of feedback you experience when tyres undergo changes in lateral load. How light the steering becomes when the front tyres lose grip, even if it feels like you've got power steering installed or not. Everything you feel from the wheel is controlled from here. Some of these settings may directly influence the feedback you get from other settings, while the others operate completely independently. Now I have spent hours trying various combinations of these settings to create the most realistic experience and have even gone to the lengths of comparing the feedback I get when driving a few in-game cars to those in real life. I believe the settings I use produce an accurate in-game recreation of how these cars felt and therefore assume the likeness to be accurate across all cars within the game. This is only an assumption as unfortunately my local Lamborghini garage wasn't keen on letting me take their Aventador out for a drive just to make an honest comparison. So let's look at the numbers. The vibration scale is sensitive, honestly it's too sensitive and it needs to be set as low as possible to a point where you can barely feel its effects. It's worth mentioning that if you come off the track and onto the grass or into the gravel and your vibration scale is set too high, the vibrations literally go crazy. Not that you want to be spending much time off the track, but it's not a nice feeling. I've set this nice and low at 10. The scale of force feedback determines the amount of torque produced by your wheel from in-game dynamic forces and the combined overall amplitude of the force feedback understeer and force feedback minimum force values. It does not however have any connection with the effects from the wheel damper or centre spring settings. For these reasons, this setting needs to be chosen while keeping in mind its influences elsewhere. I've set my force feedback scale to 67. This took a while to get right, but set here gives a realistic and firm response to tyre physics and creates a balanced feel from my understeer and minimum force settings. The wheel rotation angle refers to steering sensitivity, pure and simple. It's calculated by the amount of degrees the wheel would have to rotate to move between opposing steering locks, i.e. from full left lock to full right lock, or vice versa. The lower this value, the less rotation of the steering wheel is required to achieve maximum steering lock in either direction. I have set the rotation angle to 630 degrees, and although this makes the steering slightly less sensitive than the default setting of 600 degrees, I have set it here to complement my steering linearity setting, as both these adjustments work together. Steering linearity determines how sensitive to movement the steering wheel is depending on its angle. The higher you set this figure, the more sensitive the wheel is when closer to the centre. The lower you set this figure, the more sensitive the wheel is near full lock. I have steering linearity set at 53, making the wheel just slightly more sensitive to movement near the centre. This counteracts the sensitivity I lost from previously increasing the wheel rotation angle, while making the steering a little less sensitive towards full lock. 
for me, it's an accurate balance between linearity and the rotation angle. Force feedback understeer controls how much the torque in your wheel drops off when suffering with in-game understeer and helps to mimic that light feeling you get in real life. Initially I thought I'd just ramp this up to its maximum value. Makes sense right? I'll know I'm experiencing understeer as early as possible and will be able to do something about it. This adjustment is however particularly sensitive and the steering went so light I had to start turning it down. I got all the way down to 89 before the reduction in torque felt realistic, so that's where I've got it set. Remember my force feedback setting of 67 would have influenced this result feeling accurate at the point that it did. Force feedback minimum force is an incredible control. It really helped to align the other feedback forces to create a balanced feel to my wheel. This adjusts how the torque produced by your wheel ramps up the further away from centre you turn the wheel. Or to look at it another way, the more you steer, the more force you feel. The higher you set this value, the more torque is developed as you increase the steering angle, while becoming lighter near the centre. I set the minimum force to 116. This increased the feedback effect by a convincing amount the more I turned the wheel, and drastically contributed to the overall balanced feel through turns. Setting the value any higher increased torque a little bit too much and it began to feel a bit of a battle, especially when in an endurance race. Once again, remember my force feedback setting of 67 still influenced this result to feel realistic. The wheel damper scale simply determines the weight of the wheel. Lower values make the wheel feel light and higher values make the wheel feel heavy. This is separate to the force feedback you get from dynamic forces. This adjustment, although not directly influenced by your other force feedback settings, should still be set to help all other feedback forces line up with each other and work together for that ultra realistic feel. 78 was the setting I opted for when everything felt like it just came together, giving a more linear and natural feedback. And finally, the center spring scale. This controls how much the wheel pulls itself back to centre through the effects of gravity via the caster angle, kingpin inclination and scrub radius. The higher the value, the more centering force is produced. This one took some time to adjust until I was happy, with several laps of different tracks and different cars. It should be noted that while it is essential to get this setting correct, it has very little effect at speed. I set the centre spring scale to 93. So there you have it. Those are the figures I'm now using and I've got no intentions to change them further. If the car doesn't feel right then I get to work on the tune, not the setup of my wheel. As you take another glance over the final figures I'd firstly like to say thanks for watching. If you've got a G920 setup please try these figures out and let me know if you like them. If you're using another brand of wheel the settings will need to be different but take what you've learnt and it'd be great to hear how you get on too. And if you have any suggestions of your own, feel free to comment and let me know. And lastly, if you found this video useful, please like and share. And if you haven't already done so, feel free to subscribe for more videos. Until next time.